This is the second of the talks sponsored by RDF. A few years ago, I was at a conference and uh, taking questions at the end, and uh, I don't usually get hostile questions except from religious people, and they're extremely easy to handle. <laughs> but then I got a hostile question, which was not so easy to handle. Uh, it was a very tricky and a difficult question, and I thought, who is this? It turned out to be one of those I'm an atheist but questions which are always the most difficult to deal with. It was, of course, Lawrence Krauss. Um, uh, and um, I, I didn't take very kindly to it at the time. We've since become the firmest of friends, and I have enormous respect for what he's doing uh, in the field of public understanding of science, which is the field that I recently retired from professing. He is, of course, a most distinguished physicist, uh, author of many books. He also interests himself in science generally and in the promotion of the understanding of science generally. He's recently moved to Arizona to start what I think is an extremely exciting initiative. Um, he is associate director of the Beyond Center and co-director of the Cosmology Initiative and director of the, of the New Origins in Initiative at Arizona State University. So the study of origins, origins of all kinds, right across the board from the origin of the universe to the origin of life to the origin of everything you can think of. What, a, what an amazingly exciting uh, initiative to get started at a university. I'm delighted that Lawrence is talking to us today. Uh, please welcome him. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. Good. Um, thanks, Richard. Uh, actually, it's. Let me just say that my friendship with Richard has been. A, a unique one in many ways, but one that's caused me every time we're together to think about things slightly differently. I hope mutually, and uh, and and a, and a true pleasure and honor to to uh, to to be here. Richard asked me to talk about cosmology, um, and I originally gave. I, I talked uh, to uh, this Cornwall who was organizing this and told her what I was going to talk about, and 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 gave her several titles, and she thought they were too pre depressing, so she said, "Why don't you just make it? Uh, we're all fucked." But, uh, uh, but I decided not to use that title. Um, the, uh, I put this quote up here. Well, I like to have quotes for when, people, when, when I'm being introduced so people have something to read. But uh, it's kind of useful, I think, because I want to, I, I'm going to talk about our modern picture of cosmology and how it's changed our view of the universe, the past, and the future. And in some sense, how that picture is clearly remarkable, and far more remarkable than the fairy tales that are made up um, in most religious um, situations. And, but the key point is mystery. That's one of the things that makes science so special, I think, is that scientists love mysteries. They love not knowing. That's a key part of science, the excitement of learning about the universe. And that, again, is so different than the sterile aspect of religion where the excitement is apparently knowing everything, although clearly knowing nothing. Now, in any case, so, so that's one of the reasons why I put this quote up here. But, um, but I am going to talk to you about a mystery story. So, um, um, now I live in, in Phoenix now, and people know what these are. I, I used to live in Cleveland, and then I had to tell people these were stars. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, this is a picture of a globular cluster. And it's uh, a beautiful thing on a nice, uh, clear night. But what I want to talk to you about is how our picture has changed the universe so much that the really important stuff in the universe is not the stars and galaxies, but the stuff you can't see, the mysterious stuff that dominates nature. Uh, OK, so it's a mystery story, so let's begin. It was a dark and stormy night. And Einstein had just developed his general theory of relativity in 1916. And an interesting time, because he had developed that theory which was the first theory of not just how objects move through space, but how space itself could, 
could expand and contract and be dynamical. A remarkable theory that told us that space curves in the presence of matter. And it was beautiful, and he kind of knew it was correct. But at the time, it disagreed with observation, which used to bother physicists in the old days. And uh, the, um, the, uh, and the observation was that the universe was static and eternal. That was the conventional wisdom in science at the time, that the universe had been around forever and would be around forever. And his theory didn't agree with that, because his theory of general relativity suffered from the same problems that gra Newtonian gravity suffers from. Gravity sucks. It always pulls. It never pushes. And if you put stars and galaxies out there, they will not just stay there. Gravity will produce a universal attraction that will pull them together. And so he, he tried to figure out what to do, and, and he was able to change his theory slightly, consistent with the mathematical symmetries that allowed him to develop it. So I want to just show you how he did this. So I have his equations, which is a good thing to do at 9.45 in the morning or whatever. Um, but I, I do have them in a user-friendly fashion here. Um, okay. Um, this is for the biologists. No, I'm just joking. Um, is, but uh, the... Um, so it's not completely facetious because the, the, the left-hand side of Einstein's equations tells you about the geometry of the universe. How things are curved in the presence of the source of curvature, which in this case is the energy and momentum of the universe. So that's fine. And in fact, I, I'm a theoretical physicist, so I have to write the actual stuff, the Greek letters. That's much more illuminating to you, I'm sure. Uh, but, so this was the theory that didn't work, that explained the universe we didn't live in, or so he thought. And so he was able to change it a little bit by adding an extra term to the left-hand side, which he called the cosmological term. That, this term on the left-hand side would produce a small repulsive force throughout empty space, so small that it wouldn't affect the Newton's laws, which of course uh, described beautifully, or developed, in fact, to describe the motion of the planets around the sun, and you wouldn't want to destroy that. So so small you'd never measure it in the solar system, but it could build up on the scale of galaxies and hold galaxies apart. And so that's, what, that's how he thought he'd save his theory. Now, shortly after he introduced this term, um, it became clear that it was a problem. And in fact, um, it, it, here's a postcard I got when I was on leave once in, in, in Switzerland, at, um, in, in Zurich. And it's from Einstein to, to uh, Hermann Weyl, who's a very famous mathematical physicist. And it's in German, and some of your German is better than mine. But this basically says, it's already 1923, and he's already saying, if you get rid of a quasi-static universe, then out with the cosmological constant. Because he realized that if the universe is really expanding, which is what we now know, and I'll talk to you about how we know that, then you don't need a cosmological constant anymore. If the universe is expanding, gravity can be universally attractive and just slow the expansion. And the big question of 20th century cosmology became, is there enough gravity to stop the expansion? How will the universe end? Will it end with a bang or a whimper? Will it end with a big crunch, the reverse of the big bang? Or will expand forever. In fact, and that's the reason why I, as a particle physicist, got involved in cosmology, because I, I wanted to be the first person to know how the universe would end. It seemed like a good idea. <laughs> and you'll see where that came from. But anyway, so in 1923, Einstein said, you know, I, I wish I hadn't put it in and threw it out. But, but it was really not 1923, but 1929, when we really knew the universe was expanding. And this is the person who convinced us this is uh, someone, and I always say this, so some of you may have heard me say this before, but it's true. He, this guy always gives me faith in humanity. This is Edwin Hubble. And he began life as a lawyer and became an astronomer. And so there is hope. Uh, and he made uh, many discoveries, and I think because I'm a little short of time, I won't talk about the biggest, one of the ones he made, but the biggest one he made, of course, was the discovery that the universe is, in fact, expanding, and it changed everything. And he, this is what he discovered. Now, th these are not sperm. These are galaxies. These are, uh, again, for the biologists. Um, the, uh, um, so our galaxy is here. And when we look out, we see uh, what he discovered was that all other galaxies are moving away from us on average. And those that are twice as far away are moving twice as fast. Those that are three times as far away are moving three times as fast, etc. And so, um, and we codify this saying velocity is proportional to distance. And... Um, now, what does this tell you? Okay. Well, it, it, it obviously tells you we are the center of the universe. Okay. And uh, actually, it doesn't. And, and in fact, my wife reminds me of that on a daily basis. And uh, uh, it really means is that the universe is expanding uniformly in all directions. Now, why does that, why does this ridiculous observation that where everything is moving away from us tell us that? 
And I've spent a lot of time trying to think of different ways to explain this, none of which have been particularly satisfactory, but I, this, this, I think the only way to understand it is to get outside the universe. We're in California.